If you've been watching any of my streams over the past month or so, you know that I'm working on a header-only C99 game framework called Gunslinger. This video is going to go over some of the philosophy and the core concepts behind the framework. It's going to illustrate some of the subsystems and the layers that are involved. And then I'm going to show a quick demonstration on how to get a basic application up and running with it, and then move on to maybe a more complicated demonstration doing something like Pong. This is Game Engineering. So the purpose and the philosophy behind Gunslinger. First off, it's important to note that this isn't a game engine, it's a game framework. The main difference between the two, you can think of a game engine as being something that provides tons of abstraction and expects you to use all the core components and concepts in a very particular way in order to make games in a very particular way or applications in a very particular way. A game framework, on the other hand, is going to provide you with just enough abstraction above the boilerplate layer of code that you would need in order to implement basic layers for an application. So these layers that are provided in Gunslinger are things like the platform layer, which is responsible for giving you a window context, graphics context, being able to wrap OS specific utilities such as file loading. Also the graphics layer, which handles resource construction at the graphics level, also management of those resources and then wraps any lower level APIs like OpenGL or DirectX. And then the audio layer, which again is resource management and construction, and it wraps audio submission to the operating system. All the layers that are provided in Gunslinger are just a step above implementing them yourself. So the idea is to be able to provide as much granularity and control to the user without having to make them do it himself. Gunslinger also provides, in addition to these layers, utilities for game-specific mechanisms. These include a custom generic container library, so things like hash table, dynamic arrays, and also uh, slot arrays and slot maps, which I'll go over. It has its own custom math library, and then it has utils that sit on top of everything, on top of the core framework that can be added optionally. So things like debug drawing with immediate mode utilities, an asset management utility, a metadata or a reflection utility, and then there are others that are planned for the future. So stuff like GUI, entity component systems, physics, etc. So one of the questions I get asked all the time is why? And also why C99? Why not C++? Well, I need this framework in order to be able to use it for future videos. So any game engineering concepts that I want to go over. I'm also a tools and engine developer by trade. So I don't like using other people's stuff. I tend to like writing my own if I can. And because it's a framework and not a game engine, it could be used to make game engines. So the reason I use C99 is because it provides enough modern C features that are pretty standard and widely supported across all common compilers. The reason I use C instead of C++ is the ability to have a stable ABI across platforms, which is useful for uh, being cross-platform as much as possible, as well as porting to different languages, which I plan on doing in the future. And the library is header-only for simplicity. That's the main reason. Being able to drop in a library without having to compile it or alter build systems is incredibly useful, especially for C or C++. At the core of the framework is an engine context. Now, don't get confused with the name. Engine is shorter to write than framework, so this is the name that I'm using. Whenever you create an instance of an application for Gunslinger, a engine context which holds all the layer data necessary in order to run Gunslinger is created for you and it's registered as a static instance. This instance is held in memory and it's globally accessible. There's convenience functions for being able to access this. And this instance holds various things, the least of which is a copy of the registered application description for the user's app. The application description is what the user creates and then registers with the framework on initialization of the app. It has fields for letting Gunslinger know how to start the application and what to do with the window, such as the width, the height in the window, the title, any flags, specifically if it's resizable, if it's full frame, etc. The desired frame rate that you want to limit the application to, and then various other video settings. On start, Gunslinger creates a main window for you, and this is easily accessible through various APIs, but you can create any other windows that you would like during runtime. Gunslinger has a standard math library that it implements and provides for you. So there are standard math containers that you typically would expect to see in any math library. These are your VEC2, your VEC3, VEC4, so any of your vector types. There's also a matrix class, which is just a mat 4x4. And then there's a quaternion class as well, which is a standard quaternion definition where you have four floats. Gunslinger also provides a VQS, which stands for vector quaternion and scale. This structure is typically used for wrapping typical transformations that you would have 
things like translation, rotation, and scale, and it easily provides a simple utility for doing complex parent-child hierarchy transformations. The containers in Gunslinger aim to emulate the SDL-style containers that you would find in C++. The first is GSDynArray, which is a dynamic array of type T. It's accessible via random access just like any standard C array. There's also a provided API for standard operations that you would expect for any vector in C++, such as the ability to be able to push data back, to be able to get the back of the array, to get the size of the array, the capacity, to clear the array, to check whether it's empty, etc. GS hash table is an associative container of key type K and then a value type V. Key and V can both be any type of POD data, meaning that you can declare a struct of a particular type and then use that for the key that you want to use for your hash table. The way this works is that the key is hashed into an unsigned 64-bit integer lookup key, and then it uses that in order to probe the data. The hash table provides the expected API that you would have with an STL unordered map. So you can insert data, you can get the size, you can get the capacity, you can clear the data, you can empty it, etc. It also provides iterator for cleanly being able to iterate over the data. The next container is the slot array. The slot array is a double indirection dynamic array of type T. This is used for stable references. So in the instance that your data moves around inside of a dynamic array as it's growing, if you stored a pointer to a particular point in the data, you would lose that reference. Also, as your data is moved around internally, if you're storing an index into the array, you could lose that index or it, be, it be, could become invalidated and point to something else that you didn't intend. So what slot array does is that it creates a double array to where the user is given a uint32 opaque handle to use for data lookups into the actual data for the array. The slot array provides the exact same API that you would have for any of the dynamic array operations. It also provides the same iterator API as the hash table. The slot map works very similarly to the slot array yet it gives the extra ability to the user to be able to provide their own custom key of type K for a lookup. And then finally, the byte buffer is a dynamic uint 8t data buffer array. Gunslinger provides an API for the user to be able to insert data of any POD type and then retrieve that data back in the order that was written into the buffer. So if you've watched my serialization video, which I'll post a link to that in the description, then you should be familiar with this concept because there we create a custom byte buffer and we explain how to use it. At its core, Gunslinger is just made up of framework layers. Every single one of these layers can be user-defined and overridden. In order to do that, the user must supply implementations for all the API functions for each layer. All the data for each layer is contained within simple structs and are easily accessible by the user. There are convenience mechanisms provided for getting the data from the framework, such as in order to get the platform layer, if you wanted to get a pointer to that, you can use the GS Engine subsystem macro, and then give which layer you're interested in. In this instance, it would be the platform. The platform layer is responsible mainly for abstracting the OS specific operations and utilities. So that includes window creation, graphics API context, registration and creation, file loading, reading and writing, and then any input that you would do, whether it be the mouse, the keyboard, or the controller. All the window data is held inside of a slot array, and it's accessible via an opaque handle that's returned to the user. By default, Gunslinger provides implementations in the backend via GLFW for the following operating systems, Windows, Linux, and OS X. Should the user want, he can provide a custom implementation either to override the provided OS layers or for any custom operating systems that aren't available. The graphics layer works to abstract any common graphics API operations under one common API. So this includes resource creation, whether it be textures, buffers, shaders, etc. Also resource management and update of those resources. And then finally, the ability to be able to submit commands to the GPU in a graphics API independent manner. The graphics API is written as an explicit pipeline, which means there's maximum granularity. So unlike something like OpenGL, which is an implicit pipeline, it's more like Vulkan where it expects the user to have control over the data and then set it up directly and explicitly. However, unlike Vulkan, all the internal resources are managed by the implementation. So this includes shader handles, any texture handles, buffer handles, pipelines, or any render pass handles. All the rendering is done via pipelines that are explicitly declared by the user. And then for rendering itself, all rendering ops use command buffers to allow for multi-threaded rendering. Just like the platform layer, if the user decides that he wants a custom implementation for a backend, that can easily be done. However, by default, OpenGL is provided. All right, so the audio layer works very similarly. 
it abstracts all common operating system audio ops. So this includes being able to load audio data into buffers via WAV files, OGG files, MP3s, and then being able to upload samples to the operating system audio buffer. The audio layer provides a high level utility for loading audio sources into a managed slot array. The user at runtime can create instances to be played that reference the audio sources. The instance is a structure that has the following fields, whether or not the instance is persistent, so if it stays alive after it's done playing, the volume for the instance to be played at, the source that it's pointing to, and then whether or not you want that instance to loop. And of course, like all the other layers, the user can provide a custom implementation. However, by default, Gunslinger uses Mini Audio, which is a great header-only framework for platform-independent sound and provides backends for Windows, Linux, and Mac. As I stated earlier, Gunslinger has utilities that are provided on top of the core framework that the user can use optionally. These utilities provide features for more hands-on abstraction, and specifically they're geared more towards directed game development. So these utilities include the immediate mode drawing, the asset management for user-created custom asset types, and then a meta class data utility, which is used for reflecting any custom user data. The immediate mode drawing allows for quick rendering. It's very useful for debug rendering. It's also useful for immediate GUI. So the benefit of the immediate mode drawing is that it doesn't require the user to set up the explicit pipeline in order to do all of the different debug rendering that is capable in the immediate mode drawing. All that is handled for you and it provides an OpenGL2 type immediate mode API in order to reference into that data. The way that it works is that it tries to buffer as many commands as possible so that it can batch things up and then reduce draw calls. Provided are operations for simple text rendering with or without custom fonts, 2D shapes with or without textures. So you have rectangles, triangles, lines, circles, circle sectors, and then poly shapes, 3D shapes, so boxes and spheres, the ability to push and pop matrix modes, and then having the ability to be able to bind various states for custom drawing. So whether or not you want blending enabled, whether you want depth enabled, stencil enabled, face calling enabled, and then the primitive type to be drawn. So whether it's triangles or lines. The asset manager is another utility that sits on top of the core framework and is optional. And it acts as a utility for convenient storage and retrieval of asset data of any type that the user would like. Upon creation, the user can register an importer for a particular type. This importer lets the asset system know a couple things, namely how to load the asset from file, also how to construct a default asset of that type, and then it also acts as the storage for the asset data. Whenever you create an asset, a handle in the form of a GS asset is given back to the user. These handles have certain information in them. Mainly it lets the asset subsystem know what type the asset is by a UN64 key. And it also lets the asset manager know what importer holds the data for the asset. And there are APIs provided for the asset system in order to get back the raw data. You can either get it as a pointer or you can get a copy of that data back. The final utility that's currently up and running is the MetaClass utility. It's used for creating and registering reflection data for any given user type. The user registers new types with the MetaClass declaration structure. The reflection data is used for introspection during runtime. So we have various properties for a given type that includes the fields. You have the number of properties. And then for each property, you have the property type. So this is whether it's a uint8, a uint32, an f32, etc and then the offset, which is a number of bytes from the structure base pointer of whatever type it is. The way this is used is that given a particular type, you can query information about a given object as seen here. Before I show this off, I do want to mention that there is an example repo that I have created and I am constantly updating with new examples. So if you want to check out specific ways to handle or to implement certain things using Gunslinger, I highly recommend checking that out and I'll post the link in the description for that. So there's a few ways to get Gunslinger and be able to use it. The first is if you go to the main repo directory that I've provided in the description, you can come over here to GitHub, clone this, and then clone it into a local directory and then start to use it that way. Or you could use this GS project template, which is what we're gonna to use today, clone this, and inside of it is the latest Gunslinger implementation, as well as a starter project that shows off how to use certain things, which we're gonna go over. Okay, so we've downloaded the Gunslinger project template and there's a lot here that I'm not gonna go over just yet, but we're just gonna make sure that it runs and then we can start talking about things. So the way to do this is if you're on Windows using MSVC, 
is that we're going to use the native tools command prompt for CL and we're going to move to our directory. And then from here in the root directory, we're going to call our procedure for our given platform and then the script that we want to run. This will compile for us. And then from here, we can call into the bin folder that's created and then run the application. And then we should see, if successful, our starter project. Okay, so that works, but let's go ahead and start from scratch. So I'm going to delete everything. Now, in order to use Gunslinger, the first thing you want to do is actually define the implementation for the Gunslinger library using this macro here. Then we can include the library. Gunslinger can run in two ways. You can either run it with your own main definition or you can use the provided GS main definition. We're going to do the second. So it is expecting you to return an application description. And then here is the function signature. So this application description holds various information about what your application is going to be doing. It lets the engine know how it needs to construct your window and how it needs to run. This is the simplest application description that you can return. So what it does is it creates a lot of defaults for you. It sets the window height to be a default, the title, everything else to be defaults, and then it just runs the application for you. If we compile and run this, we'll get a black window that is set to 800 by 600, and then app is the title of our screen. Now we can't do anything. If we hit escape or if we press any of the keys, it won't be respondent. All we can do is just close the window. For the application description, there are various things that we could set. So if we want to set the window width to be something larger, we could do that. Same thing with the window height. We can also set the window title. We can set the frame rate that we want the application to run at. By default, it'll be 60 hertz. So now we run this, but we have our title here. We have a larger window. It won't be very useful if we can't actually do anything past the initialization stage. So there are a couple of function pointers that we can actually provide to the application description to let Gunslinger know where we want to hook into the user code. So we do this with our initialization, and then we also have an update, and then we have a shutdown. The function signature for each of these is the same. They're just void functions. And providing these to the application description is simple. Just provide the names of the functions that you want Gunslinger to call. We don't really have anything to initialize or clean up, so we're gonna go ahead and delete both of these. It's not useful for us, but we do want to have an update function so that we can check a couple things. So for now, we're just gonna create a simple application where if the user presses the escape key, then we're going to quit the engine. And we run the application, and then if I hit escape, we'll now quit the application. And there you go, that's the simplest gunslinger app that you can actually make. All right, so now we'll move on to the Pong example. First thing we're gonna do is again, download the project template from the repo, and then we'll run this, verify that it is working correctly. And now we can start from scratch. So to begin, we define the GS implementation, and then we do our main function, just like we did in the previous example, set everything up that we'll need, including all of our functions that we'll pass along to Gunslinger. We'll also include the immediate draw utility, and this will be used for all of our main drawing functions that we'll do for Pong. Inside of the game data structure, we'll have a command buffer, which we're going to use to buffer up commands to send to the graphics subsystem, and then our immediate draw utility, which is what we'll use to draw the game. Gunslinger provides an ability in the app description for the user to pass in a pointer to any user data that they want to use. And then with a convenient macro, you can grab a pointer to that game data anywhere throughout the code. Just to verify that everything's working, we're gonna go ahead and set up a draw function where we will clear the screen and then submit the command buffer to the graphics subsystem. Now we can actually start to define some constants and defines that we'll need for the game. First off, we'll start with the game field so the X and the Y dimensions for the field, and then we'll have some helper macro functions to get the window size from the platform layer. Back in our draw game function, we'll go ahead and draw the field. First, we'll cache some of our pointers, grab the window size using that macro, and then using the GSI rect function, we can draw the game field onto the screen.
in order to do this, we'll set up a 2D camera so that we'll have screen coordinates for all of our rendering. Next, we'll set up some dividing lines between the two game fields for the left and the right. The way we'll do this is we'll just do a number of steps and then draw rectangles at each of those steps, dividing the line. And then if we render that here, we can now see the dividing line. Next up, we'll start defining some paddle definitions. So we have the width and the height, as well as the speed for our paddle. And then the paddle struct is simply just going to be the positions for each of the paddles. We'll have an enum for the left and the right side, as well as a count, so that we can iterate over paddle data. And then for the game data, we'll go ahead and add in an array of paddles for the left and the right paddle. Initializing the paddles is fairly simple. We just need to be able to have some dimensions using those constants. And then we'll set up the positions of each of the paddles. So the left will be on the left side of the screen, and then the right will be on the right side of the screen. And both will start at halfway point down from the top and the bottom of the screen. Rendering the paddles is very simple. We iterate over all the paddles in the array, and we find two VEC2s, the bottom left and then the top right corners of the rectangle in order for us to draw them using the GSI rect command. And when rendered, this is what they look like. So we need a way to be able to update the paddles. So we'll create a function called update paddles where we'll pass in the game data. For this, we'll grab the window size and we're gonna define a min and max field that the paddles can move in up and down. They'll be locked to the Y axis. And then we'll check left and right movement. If the W key is pressed, we'll move the left paddle up. If the S key is pressed, we'll move it down. And then for the right paddle, if the up key is pressed, we'll move it up. And then if the down key is pressed, we'll move it down. When we run this, now we can see that we have accurate movement and they're locked between the confines that we came up with. Okay, next up is the ball. So again, we'll define the width, height, and the speed, and then give us a macro in order to get the dimensions of the ball data. And the ball as a structure will be something that has a position and a velocity, and we'll add that to our game data. It's gonna be useful to have an initialization function for the ball, as well as an update function. So we'll go ahead and design those real quick. Rendering the ball is very simple. Again, it's just like the paddles. We get the bottom left and top right corner. We want to initialize the ball to be in the center of the screen. So we're just going to set its position to that. And initially the velocity of the ball will be set to the top left corner of the screen. And once we render, there's the ball in the center of the screen. For updating the ball, what we want to check is that based on the velocity, we want to move from the previous frame. And then we want to check to see if we have conditions met for resetting the ball completely or just resetting the position to update the velocity. We want to check against the bottom and top walls. If we hit that, then we just want to invert the velocity in the Y element. And then we'll check against the left and the right walls. If we hit the right wall, then we increment the score of the left paddle and we reset the ball. If we hit the left, then we want to increment the score of the right paddle. Here we'll reset the position. And if we need to reset the ball completely, then we'll reinitialize the ball. We can go ahead and print out the scores real quick, just to the console, so that we can view what the scores will be to verify that we are in fact incrementing the score. Now it's a little boring if we can't actually move the paddles in order to interact with the ball. In order for this to work, we're gonna use the AABB structs that are available in Gunslinger. We'll define the min and the max to be the bounds of the ball and the paddle, and then have helper functions for getting those. And then inside of the balls update, all we have to do is check against the left, right, and ball AABBs. If any collision occurs between either of those, then we'll just change the velocity of the ball in the X direction, and then reset the position. And here we can see that working.
Finally, what we need are some assets. So first we're going to include the asset implementation for the asset manager. We'll initialize that. And then we'll add in some assets. So here we're gonna add in the font so that we can render both the title and the scores to the screen. And we can do that with the load file function. If you load the font correctly, you should see an output to the console to let you know that it's been successfully loaded. And then in our draw function, we'll cache the pointer for both the asset manager as well as the pointer using the font handle that we've stored inside of our game data. And then rendering the title is as simple as just calling the text command with the font pointer that we want to use. For the scores, we'll iterate over the scores, and then we'll use the snprintfc function to declare a temp buffer with formatted text where we can actually render the score at a given position using the gsi text command. All right, so the last thing to do is we actually need to add sound. So we'll add in some assets into the game data for both when the ball hits, as well as whenever a player scores. We'll load in those using the exact same load from file function, given those file paths. And when you load in the audio, you should get a success message, whether or not the audio loaded correctly. Go ahead and create a helper function for playing the sounds. So all we need to do is pass in the asset manager, the source and the volume that we want to play the audio at. And then using the audio subsystem play from source, we'll use the audio's handle in order to play that at the given volume. Then whenever the ball needs to reset its position, we'll play the sound for the ball hitting the paddles. And then whenever the user scores, we'll play the score audio effect. All right, I hope you enjoyed the video. Leave a like and subscribe. All the links in the description if you wanna check out Gunslinger or any of the examples or any of the projects that were in the video. And then there's a link for the Discord if you'd like to join that as well. And as always, thanks for watching.